Hero Extreme 200R is finally here and we have its full review. The Audi A6 sedan, global new generation car, that review as well. So as you've seen, there's lots coming your way over the next half hour. I'm Siddharth Vinayak Patankar. Welcome to CNB. We will get started straight off then with the latest from Hero. And it's a while since I said that. An all new product from Hero. Well, it's been a long time coming and this one's been promised to us for quite some time too. And we had an unveil event many weeks ago before the Auto Expo. Finally, the Extreme, the new bike, 200, is ready to hit the market. And Pritham spent a fair amount of time with it at the BIC. It's the newest 200cc premium commuter motorcycle in the market, the Hero Extreme 200R. But is Hero already late to a party in one of the fastest growing motorcycle segments in the market right now? A segment which has already proven quite popular with contenders like the TVS Apache RTR 204V and of course the Bajaj Pulsar NS200. We spent some time with the new 200cc premium commuter but at a racetrack. We're at the Bud International Circuit yet again with another motorcycle and this time we're with Hero Motor Corp's newest motorcycle, the Extreme 200R. Uh, what is it? It's a premium commuter motorcycle in a 200cc segment and Hero's quite late to join the party in this segment but here it is finally the new Extreme 200R. It's got a 200cc single cylinder air-cooled engine which is a bored out version of the 150cc engine of the Hero Achiever and it makes about 18 odd bhp of power and about 17 newton meters of torque. The Extreme 200R looks quite well proportionate from most angles and our favorite part of the bike's design is the tail section. Sleek, tapering to a sharp end with the LED tail light and those split grab rails. The exhaust muffler is a fat unit but could have been slightly more aesthetically pleasing. Up front, the Extreme 200R gets LED pilot lamps but no LED headlight and the instrument panel, although neat, looks a generation older with the rather plain part digital, part analog unit. And there's no gear position indicator as well, something we've become quite used to in the latest 160 bikes as well. The fuel tank gets fat shrouds and the big extreme body graphics are loud and could have certainly been a little more subtle, at least to us. Overall, it is not a bad looking motorcycle though and is certain to find some appeal particularly to those not looking for an overtly spotty looking 200cc bike. In terms of feature and equipment, what the Extreme 200 gets is a part analog, part diesel speedometer. Uh, well, the diesel panel doesn't get a gear position indicator as yet, uh, which is a miss. Uh, of course, it gets LED pilot lamps up front, 37mm telescopic front fork, a 276mm front disc, which gets ABS on the front wheel, only single channel ABS. The rear wheel also gets a disc, but uh, no ABS on the rear wheel. It monoshock at the rear 7 step adjustable and an LED tail light as well. On the move, the 200cc engine isn't very fast and is par for the course in this segment. Speed picks up quickly enough and the bike drops eagerly into corners at the BIC. In fact, handling is the Extreme 200R strong point coupled with the torquey engine which requires few downshifts around the corners of the racetrack. In fact, the bike feels so confident around corners, we pushed it to its limits and beyond, grinding and shaving off those foot peg feeler bolts. Of course, that's not the way a bike is meant to be ridden and designed to be ridden, but on the street and in the real world, the Extreme 200R promises to be a stable, torque motorcycle with decent brakes, which will be welcomed by consumer looking for a strong, stable and relatively powerful commuter motorcycle. Well, we've just finished a few laps around the BIC on the new Hero Extreme 200R. Uh, first impressions, well, let's talk about the engine and the performance. Uh, it's a single cylinder air-cooled 200cc, uh, makes about 18 bhp of power and about 17.1 Nm of torque. It's a carbureted engine, so no fuel injection on offer as yet. 
Well, the engine is a torque unit, a two valve engine. Uh, torque unit, so out in the street, you won't really need to change gears too much. Uh, made primarily for city use, so full points there. I think a lot of people will uh, quite welcome this bike. What is also the Extreme 200R's other strong point is the overall refinement level of the engine. Despite being a two valve unit, the 200cc air cooled engine is quite smooth and delivers power in linear fashion. It's all about pulling cleanly from higher gears with a strong mid range. What is important, however, is how Hero Motor Corp prices this bike. It's targeted primarily at the commuter who's looking to upgrade to a slightly bigger engine. Uh, of course, we've ridden it on a racetrack and decimated the foot pegs, taking the corners here, yeah, but that's not how this bike is meant to be ridden. It's primarily for a guy who's looking to upgrade uh, to a slightly larger engine commuter motorcycle. And like we said earlier, Hero is late to the party in this 200cc segment. So pricing will be key. Uh, the bike is going to be launched in a few weeks from now. Our guess is sometime around June, uh, latest end June or early July at the most. And what will be key is the pricing. Uh, if Hero manages to price it about rupees 90,000 ex showroom or even slightly less than that, then this one certainly seems to be a winner to rake in some sales volume in this rapidly growing 200cc segment. From a purely performance point of view, the Extreme 200R may leave performance junkies wanting for more, particularly when they are sportier, marginally more powerful rivals in the 200cc segment like the Apache 200 and the Pulsar 200. But not everyone seeks a sporty and performance oriented premium commuter. And as a no nonsense, practical, and slightly powerful commuter motorcycle, the Xtreme 200R leaves no room for complaints. A lot riding on the new generation A6 for Audi. This car has to beat the competition, and a lot has been loaded into it as a result. Is it that good? I had a chance to drive it, and here's my review. The Douro Valley is probably one of the prettiest places in Europe and provided an excellent backdrop to test the all-new 5th generation Audi A6 sedan. A lot is expected from the new one and I'm happy to report that Audi has delivered. The engine lineup on which the A6 is being introduced is the choice of 1 petrol and 3 diesels. Yes, 3 diesels. There's the 55 TFSI, a petrol V6 with 333 bhp and 500 nm of torque India is likely to get that as well as the smallest diesel the 40 TDI that's the 2 litre 4 cylinder 200 bhp 400 nm motor the other two diesels use the same 3 litre block in varying states of tune 228 and 282 bhp I began my drive with the new 2 litre diesel or 40 TDI model that's been reworked for the A6 the first thing that strikes you is the motor feels really refined Unlike the rest of the range which gets largely updated engines, good engines no doubt but updated, this one is the all new 2 litre 4 cylinder diesel and um, there's a lot that's been talked about this engine, it's the first time it's coming to the A6 family anyway and uh, what it does is it ties in really well with the Ultra Quattro but that's not where I'm going with this. The point is that you of course have the 3 litre diesels as well and there's two iterations so a lot more power. Now don't get me wrong, you get 200 horses on this one, you get 400 Nm of torque, it comes in nice and low as well. So uh, having too much power or not wanting to have too much power, is that a thing? It's not. Of course I want more power and more torque. The question is, do I really need it? Uh-uh. This engine does the job on this car perfectly you could always opt for the 3 liter v6 diesels for more power but the 2.0 TDI does the job very well the handling and ride are also several steps ahead of the car that it replaces drive this car just for a few minutes and you instantly get a sense of a really sure product the ride quality is fantastic handles so well in fact so much better than the last car which felt huge. This car feels nice and compact just from the way it feels physically and then also the way it drives. Mm -hmm. 
Now the part that has me a little bit surprised, let me go into drive select and I'm going to switch to dynamic. You know, everything stiffens up as it should in any kind of sport mode, but the steering still stays kind of nice and light. Now that could be a little bit of a disappointment to the people who really want something a little extreme, but considering that this is a business sedan, I like that. I like the fact that it doesn't really, you know, stiffen up too much and become exaggeratedly hard. This is nice. It's comfortable. It is extremely precise. It's very sporty still, and it still goes with the rest of the attribute of dynamic. Just not a pain to drive, especially in the Indian conditions. Now I know a lot of you will be saying that, hey, hang on, it's just the chauffeurs who are going to get these cars, not the owners. But hear me out. It will certainly make for fatigue-free driving, and I like the way the steering feels. It's really precise. The A6 has Ultra Quattro as standard and it works effectively to give you the sense of control you expect from it. There is optional 4 wheel steering too which makes control even better. The A6 has drive select of course with efficiency, comfort, dynamic, auto and individual modes. Now on the A6 a lot of things have gotten close to being standard like the virtual cockpit, like the fact that you have these two screens instead of all the buttons and things like that. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later but the larger point being that uh, the whole idea is to make the car a little more luxurious, a little more swanky. Leather is standard. You don't have fabric seats like uh, BMW or Mercedes offer, for example, in Europe. Now, in India, of course, none of that is relevant because we always get the fully loaded, sort of pampered specs. And it's going to be no different with this one, too. But uh, I will say this, that, you know, there are a few technical things that you could opt for. The air suspension, the four-wheel steering. Now, the car I have right now is the basic one, so it doesn't have all those. And uh, in a way, it's a good thing because I get to test what it feels like and then maybe try a car with all of that. And I'll tell you if there's a huge difference. The steel springs on my test car gave me a great sense of assurance while also providing the right levels of dynamic handling. Of course, the air suspension I tried next on the A655 TFSI is even better since it lowers the chassis in dynamic mode and lifts it in comfort, giving you enhanced levels of sportiness and cushioning respectively. Now the roads here in the Dora Valley are great, they're nice and narrow, but uh, nice and twisty as well and it's uh, giving me a great chance to really sort of test the dynamic skills of this car. It's gotten so much sport here and that's an instant takeaway you have. The little downside of the fact that these roads are so twisty and winding is that you have to keep your eyes on the road. There is oncoming traffic, the road is narrow and it really shows up that little bit of a chink when it comes to, you know, going fully touch screen with everything. Now it's really nice, it looks really cool and the interface, especially when you turn the car off, everything goes black, looks really nice too, very sexy. But, you know, you've got to keep sort of taking your eyes off the road to adjust the temperature or you know to go um, fan speed or yeah too many inputs little knobs dials switches it's just so much easier because you you don't even have to look down you sort of instinctively know what to do I guess it's just a matter of getting used to because I'm not an analog guy I am the digital guy it's not like I'm trying to be a purist or an old timer here that's not it but those screens are still very cool and probably the sign of things to come. Of course, I've switched over to the 3 litre V6 petrol. You've got uh, 333 horses, 500 horsepower, and it's mated to the same 7 speed S Tronic gearbox. But it just feels so much quicker, this gearbox, of course, with this engine. And it is, I have to say, especially when you compare it to that four cylinder uh, diesel that I was driving earlier. But the bigger point is about the engine. Now, it's not a new engine. It's something that's familiar. I've, I've known it for, for a while. So many different models have used it. But with every new adoption, with every new use of this engine, it's amazing what the engineers can do. They're just, it's not just about getting more power or getting more punch out of it. It's also just so much more refinement. If you aren't the chauffeur-driven sort, this is the variant that will give you the obvious sense of power that the 40 TDI may not. I'm going to switch the car across now to the efficiency mode on the drive select. There you go. The 3 liters actually have a mild hybrid system as standard, which means that there is a battery on board. It's not a full-on hybrid, so it's a small battery, but it keeps storing all the regenerative power 
that you're getting from the time you're driving so every time you brake every time you're uh, doing some dynamic driving sharp turns etc it'll keep taking some of that energy and storing it and uh, all the recuperated energy can be used then to make the overall running of the car a lot more uh, smooth and a lot uh, more efficient of course but think about it now as another additional thing that's uh, very very different to what you've seen on regular very rudimentary mild hybrids so it's not just about a start stop system but think about it as a start stop system while the car is actually still moving well it cuts off the engine it takes some of this power that's stored and uh, over very short distances will allow you to run on that power it makes the cars running even more efficient just a lot more green than uh, in a normal car the 55 TFSI will have everything as standard, but expect lots to be on standard on both fuel types in India. After all, this car will have to deal with stiff competition from the new E-Class, 5 Series and even the Volvo S90. The new A6 looks very sexy and it will grab a lot of attention on the road. The roads in Porto were perfect for testing the car as I said, with plenty of variety on our drive routes. I'm constantly driving through these little vineyards and uh, I haven't seen anything large in terms of just acreage, you know, so I'm not seeing any of the big commercial vineyards, though I know they're around in this area. Because of course Porto is famous for the port wine that's world famous. And uh, there's of course different varieties of grapes besides just the port that come from here. And uh, it is beautifully stunning because all these little vineyards are obviously, you know, not even boutique firms, they're probably just family run. Uh, farms and uh, it's beautiful to just be able to drive through all of this the countryside here has been absolutely stunning and so different to the other parts of Portugal that we usually take you to so it is definitely really attractive now the new generation of the Audi A8 is the reigning world luxury car of the year and there's a reason why it beat out all its really strong rivals for that award now, why am I talking about the A8 when I'm standing next to the A6? Well, because in many ways, this is the baby A8. Oh, and I promise you, that's not a bad thing. Yes, it does take a lot of its styling cues from big sis A8. In fact, since the new A5, A8, A7 and now the A6 have come out, I feel Audi is finally stepping out of its cookie cutter design strategy. The face is bold. The white grille makes the car look sure and imposing. The headlamp is stunning with slim DRLs and matrix LED lights made up of 32 LED units. And all of that's likely to be standard on the Indian spec. Now my favorite bit of the design is just this really what looks like a subtle line but it's actually a really sharp crease that runs into the back. You also see it when you're driving in your rear view mirror so it's really nice and it comes into what's an extremely different and uh, very dynamic rear end. The taillight cluster certainly is going to be the character defining and recognizable element on the new A6. The masculinity that comes through the car's exterior styling is great since it gives the A6 a definite stance and so much presence. The taillights are the car's signature with sharp horizontal LED lines and short vertical ones below it. Both are separated by a chrome strip that runs through both taillights. The boot volume is 530 litres, despite storing that lithium-ion battery below its floor. On the inside, the A6 will truly impress as the cabin has moved up several notches on not just design, materials and gadgets, but most importantly on comfort. The virtual cockpit, a big USB for an Audi, is standard on the A6. The virtual cockpit is something rivals have been desperately trying to replicate. The big screen display on the instruments is crisp and can be customised for bigger or smaller dials full screen navigation and so much more. The real X factor comes from those twin touch screens on the central console. The lower screen can be used to provide written inputs for the navigation or phone. The upper screen is wider and provides a great interface especially for connectivity options like Apple CarPlay or the Maps. Audi will bring the car to India only around the middle of 2019. Yes, that's very far away, but it will be a similar timeline as the A8L which arrives to our shows this year, a year after its global debut. Expect prices to stay competitive and perhaps the 3.0-litre V6 diesel could also be made available subsequently based on customer demand and feedback. By the way, the car I've been showing you right through the episode today is the Kia Carnival. It's not a car that's destined for India, but it's a car that Kia is now considering or assessing for India. 
you can react to it. You want to know more about it? Go to our website, carandbike.com and check out what I have to say about it. On that note, I'm going to say goodbye. Please wear your seatbelts. Please wear your helmets. Join me next week.